I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Office of Work Life and Elder Care within the Office of Work Life. And we are very excited today to be welcoming Mike McKinley and Sarah Muncy. Mike McKinley is what? I was not sure if she could see me. Okay. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Mike McKinley is an attorney with Elder Care Law of Central Kentucky, and Sarah Muncy is their Elder Care Coordinator. So we're very thankful that they were able to come today. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm really hoping that the people watching this on their computer screen can hear me. Um, if not, I'm not sure what to do about it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna behave as if you can't hear me and we'll go from there. So, if I can get this attached. Okay, so in your handouts, if you're watching from your computer screen, um, you should be able to pull up some of the handouts so there's uh, there's a handout called Facts and Figures. There's a handout that has my bio and Sarah's bio. Uh, there's a handout that says, what is an elder law attorney? Um, I'm going to hit on that really quick. An elder law attorney basically <clears throat> is a description of the demographic that the attorney serves more than it is the description of the area of law that he serves, okay? We've all, uh, we know that family lawyers do divorce and custody. We know estate planning lawyers do estate planning. Uh, litigation lawyers do civil litigation, personal injury lawyers. So an elder law attorney might do some, a little bit of every one of those, but our primary demographic that we serve is 60, age 65 and older. So what, I, what my law firm focuses on, we are a life care planning law firm which means that in addition to the traditional elder law attorney work, which is the financial planning, the asset protection planning, uh, Medicaid, nursing home, long-term care planning, we also do the life care planning. And basically life care planning, that's what Sarah does. Uh, I, don't, I don't do any of that. What I found is I had clients coming to me for the uh, – I had clients coming to me for the estate planning and the financial planning, and we would get all that done, and it, it, you know, I'd say, congratulations, there is a strategy, I can help you, and they would heave a huge sigh of relief, and then immediately they would dive into all of the other worries and issues that they were having. You know, mom's taking care of dad, but now mom's health is deteriorating because it's killing her to be taking care of dad. That mom and dad promised that they would never put each other in a nursing home, and we don't know what to do. And dad's forgetting everybody's name, and he's you know they wrote a check to some uh, evangelist down in Texas or what you know. So there's all these different questions. What level of care does dad need? Where is the where do I find this level of care for dad? Um, you know this is going on in the nursing home, and I don't know if that's okay. You know what should we expect? These are all questions that I felt like I, I don't really know the answer to a lot of these questions. I, I don't feel comfortable giving my client a recommendation about, you know, if your dad is at this level of health and, and functionality and is needing this, uh, this many activities of daily living, help with those, you really should transition to, to an assisted living facility. I'm not trained for that. I'm, I'm just a lawyer. So what, what do I know about that? So, I want to provide that service for my clients because there's a really, there's a genuine need for those questions to be answered. So that's why I brought in Sarah. Uh, Sarah has a experience working in the facilities. She's worked in long-term care and nursing home facilities. She's done assessments. She can actually go to the client's home, look at their home. Is it safe? Is there accommodations that can be made to help dad stay at home safely? Maybe we can prevent the fall that gets them to the hospital and eventually leads to the nursing home in the first place. Um, and I find that the, there's a huge value added for my clients in providing that service. So that's what Sarah does. If, uh, there's a life care planning law firm association that I'm a, that I'm a member of. In the handouts, there's the, uh, the 10 signs that, family need, that families need help. That talks a lot about that. The brochure that, that for the people who are here, uh, goes into depth about the life care planning part of it. But for the rest of for the rest of the time today, I'm going to focus more on 
P, uh, legal documents, financial documents, uh, financial planning, and I'm going to try to go through all this stuff, just a very broad brush, things that you guys should be thinking about if you or your loved ones are getting around that age. And, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not at that age yet, you, it's almost certain that you have a loved one who is. So this is very pertinent information. You know, the baby boomers are, are all growing older, and, you know, you can pretty much track the American economy following the baby boomers uh, throughout history. You look when the baby boomers all started turning 16 and getting their driver's license, the automobile industry just exploded, and then the housing industry exploded. And then as they, they grew older, the financial services industry exploded. They all started making good money. And then the Harley Davidsons, you know, they, the baby boomers started turning 40 and they decided they were going to be road warriors. And so Harley Davidson exploded with, with all their sales. So what the next stage in, in following this generation is the long-term care and trying to protect assets. And there's going to be a huge transfer of wealth that takes place over the next 20 years. The question is going to be, is the wealth transferred to family members or is the wealth transferred to nursing homes? Uh, and I hate to sad to say right now the nursing homes are winning the, the, the battle. They are they are getting more money than the families are getting right now. So I'm going to focus on that in, in my uh, in my little speech. I don't think of it as a speech; it's more of a conversation. So if somebody has a burning question, raise your hand. I will repeat the question for the sake of the people uh, watching us on the computer, and then I'll I'll try to address those as we go. So. These are some statistics. If you look uh, look at your folder, there's a fax of figures. These are general. They're, they're not going to be perfect because they change them every time they do a new study. The, the exact figures will change. But this is close enough for what we're looking at. Um, the scariest part of these statistics, in my opinion, uh, one out of eight Americans over the age of 65 has dementia. Half of Americans over 85 is dealing with dementia of some type. And if you live to be 80 years old, which a lot of us are living to be 80 years old, there's a 50% chance that you're going to need a nursing home at some point. So if anybody thinks that, that they don't need the services of an elder law attorney or that the planning is not, um, is not required for you, I would, I would hope that you reconsider that. If I told you guys that there was a 50% chance that your home was going to burn down, through a fire. I don't think anyone in here would, would go without homeowners insurance. In fact, if you look at the statistics, uh, the, you might have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than your home burning down, particularly if you don't have a wood burning stove in your home. So, but everybody has homeowners insurance, right? So nobody would ever go through, you know, they would never just let their homeowners insur insurance lapse. But if you look at the actual numbers, that's not the big, that's not a really big threat to your home. What is a big threat to your home? Well, if you have to go into a nursing home, which costs six to seven to eight thousand dollars a month, eventually that gets into the equity of your home. So if you look at it in that way, your home is on fire as soon as you go into a nursing home. And it's a race. Hope and, and think about this. You go into a nursing home and you, you think to yourself, I really hope I die before I run out of money, okay? So when my, I don't think that's a very good way to plan, personally. Uh, my philosophy as an attorney is to plan for the worst case scenario while allowing my clients to enjoy the best case scenario. But we do that through various uh, instruments and various planning techniques. One thing I want to jump on and, and talk about, I, I just spoke to it like, an hour and 45 minutes last week about POAs and guardianships. So I can really talk about this stuff for a long time if you give me a chance. So it's really dangerous to give me a, a captive audience because I can go for quite a while. But the most important legal document that every person can have, um, particularly once, once they get above the age of 65, is a durable power of attorney that is effective immediately. The old power of attorneys, the old way that lawyers used to do them, they were springing power of attorneys, which meant 
they didn't actually, the, the power of attorney didn't actually exist until some event took place and then it would spring into existence. And so it was very common to see a power of attorney. It was either on one or two pages. It said, anything I can do, they can do. It was very broad. It said, and it takes two, two doctors have to sign a, a document saying that I'm incompetent and I need help managing my finances before this POA is effective, okay? Those aren't worth the paper they're written on. Because number one, you're not gonna find a doctor who's gonna sign a, a document for the court saying, yeah, he needs to let his son manage his finances. Because what if his son steals all of his money? So the doctors just are not gonna go through that. They're not, they're not gonna take that kind of risk. They're gonna tell you, I'm sorry, you need to go file for an emergency guardianship and let the courts deal with it. Because I don't want that kind of liability. So the last place you wanna be if your loved one it needs surgery or if your loved one needs you to write a check for them or help them be admitted to a nursing home or a long-term care facility, the last thing you wanna do is have to pay an attorney to go to court and file for a guardianship and potentially have a jury trial, which Kentucky is one of the only state, is the only state in the country that still requires a jury trial for uh, the determination of incompetency. Then you've got social workers and state psychologists come into your home to do evaluations and doctors trying to, and you have to prove to the court that yeah, mom really does need a guardian. And from that point forward, you're answering to the court for everything you do. If you want to sell the home, you have to make a motion to the court, give permission, send waivers to all the family members. It's a nightmare, okay? I like to call it necessary evil. Okay, but it's evil nonetheless. You don't want the court being involved in your decision making. Okay, if we had more time, I would I would uh, go into depth of where guardianships were created, and it goes back to you know the feudal times when the king owned all the all the pet. You know, we're all peasants, and the king owns us all, and he would assign magistrates to oversee uh, anyone who was not mentally capable of taking care of their own stuff and all that. But the bottom line is. If you take nothing else away from this speech today, have a durable power of attorney in place before you need it, okay? Now, some people say, well, you know, Mike, I don't, I don't know if I wanna give my son the power to just go in and start writing checks on me right now. I say, well, you wanna wait until you're mentally incompetent to give him that power? You know, give him the power now while you're still, while you still have capacity, if you can't trust them, they don't need to have the power in the first place. So this idea that, that I don't want the power of attorney to even kick in until I'm mentally incompetent, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. You need to you need to put it in place while you can still do something about it if someone acts it in a manner that they shouldn't. So another, another important aspect of the power of attorney document is that it actually does what you need it to do. For example, it needs to give your attorney, in fact, the power to do trusts, to create trusts for estate planning purposes. It needs to give your attorney, in fact, the power to make gifts. Because anything we do to protect your assets is going to include gifting. We're going to gift it to a trust. We might gift it to a, a disabled uh, child. And I mean, it can be physically disabled, not, not mentally. So, a lot of my clients have children who are on social security disability. They've gotten hurt at work or whatever, and they're disabled. Well, there, there are planning techniques that involve transferring assets to those children because they're not penalized transfers for Medicaid purposes. Um, so we need a POA that gives you the power to do those types of things. You need the power to sell real estate. It has to be explicit in the document. The old, anything I can do, you can do, this doesn't work for a lot of things. So the, the document has to have an express provision that says you're allowed to gift, you're allowed to sell real estate, you're allowed to do estate planning, so on and so forth, okay? I put in every document that you're allowed to self-deal. Now, I've, I've had some arguments with Can other people. Can I interrupt things, and ask a question? I believe that if a, if a child is also the POA, which it usually is a child, and the child is acting in a manner that is going to preserve mom's estate, 
how is she not self-dealing? Because she is going to benefit from that. As long as she's an heir of the estate, anything she does to save mom and dad's money, she would be a direct beneficiary of that behavior. It's debatable whether that's self-dealing by definition, but I put them in there anyway, just, just to be careful, just to be on the safe side. Now, new POA laws were passed in July that help, were helpful. They strengthened the POA. Financial institutions, it was, very, it was very common that they just ignore POAs unless they were uh, produced on their own, uh, their own document. So like Merle Lynch had their own POA that you had to sign if you wanted them to honor. Otherwise, they would just ignore your POA. Well, the new laws don't allow that anymore. Uh, bad thing is you have to now have new POAs that were created after July of last year. Now I have to have two witnesses. Okay, the old ones, you can just notarize the signature. They didn't need one. So, yes, you have a question. I have a question on online. Um, the question is, how is durable different than medical POA? Good question. A durable power of attorney is, a, so there, there's financial power of attorneys and there's medical power of attorneys. When I say durable power of attorney, I'm speaking about a financial power of attorney. Okay, um, durable just means that the power of attorney stays effective even if the uh, principal loses their mental capacity. So, you know, and the, the language has to be in there. Now, the new law assumes that they're durable. So the, that they used to be an issue we have is, a, you know, if the, the document was not uh, properly created by the attorney and they didn't put the words durable, then they assumed that it was not durable. So if you lost your mental capacity, the POA was no good any longer. It's like, well, what good is that, right? So uh, the new POAs assume durability. Uh, so you, if you didn't want it to be durable, you would have to, and you think of, and there are lots of uh, instances where it might come up. Maybe I want to be out of town. I want my wife, I'm selling real estate. And I want my wife to be able to sign for me and sell this real estate. I can give her a limited power of attorney just for the limited purpose of signing and selling this real estate. Well, I can give that to anyone. Uh, but when I say the words durable power of attorney, I'm, sp I'm speaking mainly of the financial that allows people to uh, buy, sell, trade, purchase insurance, uh, write checks, you know, collect debts, all that good stuff, okay? Now, on the healthcare POA, I had a question before this started about is a healthcare POA the same thing as a living will? And it, it can be. Some living wills create a healthcare POA at the same time. The living will in general, Kentucky has a check the box living will. You can check the box, yes, I do want to be given artificial nourishment, or no, I do not want to be given artificial nourishment. Yes, I do want to be plugged in, no, I don't want to be plugged in. Yes, I do want to have my organs available for donation, no, I don't. Um, I used to do those, I don't do them anymore unless my clients insist on them. Uh, they're, they're routinely ignored by hospitals and by um, EMS uh, professionals. The best practice, and this is the, the industry best practice as, as best we can figure out right now, is to have someone that you trust who knows what you want. You know, a lot of, a lot of the problems that we have is people don't talk about this stuff. I have, I have lots of families come in. Mom might already be incompetent with dementia or what have you, and daughter doesn't even know whether or not mom wants to be burned or buried when she passes away. These, you know, don't wait to have these conversations. So see, the first thing I do, if there's an elephant in the room, I introduce it and we start talking to it. Okay? <laughs> so you need to know these things. Pick the person who you think would make the decision that you would otherwise make Trust them to make the right decision because there's so many there, there are so many variables that you can't account for where what you would ordinarily do might not be that that way in this scenario. When we talked about you know tax laws, maybe if I stay plugged in for one more month, I might my family would benefit from a whole new set of tax laws if I die next year instead of this year. Um, those are real scenarios. I mean that really did happen back in 2010. So um, or you know if, if if I'm brain dead and for some reason my family would feel a lot better if they waited one more month before they pull the plug, am I really going to be upset if that happens? Personally, no, I'm not. But some people might be. 
So pick a person, make them your healthcare surrogate, give them the healthcare POA, let them make those decisions in those areas. And it's not like they can override what you want if you're able to speak for yourself. Those only come into play if you're unable to speak for yourself. So as long as you have capacity and you're able to speak, you can always tell the doctor, I do want this or I don't want that, and you can make choices. That reminds me about the guardianship. The guardianships are probably the most obtrusive and, what's the word? I don't know what the right word. They take away your rights more than any other thing we have in the law. A, a convicted murderer, a convicted felon in prison has more legal rights than someone who's under guardianship. Okay? They still have the right to dispose of their own property. They still have the right to deny medical treatment and pick what medical treatment they would like to receive. They have they don't get they don't have a right to choose where they live, obviously, because they're in prison, but they still have a lot of these rights that we all take for granted. When you become under a guardianship, you no longer have those rights. You, you're literally a child of the state, owned by the court, and the court appoints who's going to take care of you and who's going to make your decisions. And because the overload is so heavy in Kentucky right now, there's virtually no oversight. So who knows what's going to happen? Um, if you think about these things ahead of time, it's, it's much better. So let's get into the planning. Let's jump to the uh, all right. So as we get into the PowerPoint, if you guys have this uh, handout, if you jump, in, jump in this red window. So part of the life care planning model, if, if you look at this handout, every, every older person, we call them healthy older people, they start out on the far left, where they have no functional limitation, they live at home, it doesn't cost them anything. Okay? That's where, every, that's where all of our parents and grandparents start at. As they lose their functional limitation, as, they're, as they start needing more and more help with their activities of daily living, they're going to move along this, this chart to the right. Well, what happens is if you don't plan or you don't have money to begin with, you might be, you might live, be living at home and need assistance, but not get the assistance that you need. So what that leads to is maybe you fall. Maybe you're getting out of the shower, you need help getting dressed, something happens, you fall, hit your head, now all of a sudden you're in the hospital. The path to the nursing home usually is you live at home by yourself, un unsafely. Something happens, you fall, you get sick, you're in, something puts you in the hospital. You have a qualifying stay in the hospital for Medicare, after which is three days in the hospital. From there, Medicare says, we're discharging you, you're not getting any better, now you're in a long-term care situation. They discharge you to the nursing home. Usually the nursing home does some kind of rehab for a, a limited period of time, but they're getting really strict about how long you can stay in rehab. So at some point, Medicare says, okay, you're in long-term care only, you've got 20 days that they're gonna pay for. After day 20, they, you have to pay a co-insurance. Co which is 170 or 171 dollars and 50 cents for the from day 20 to day 100. After day 100, you're completely cut off from Medicare and you're paying out of pocket. Okay, so if it, it might be 220 or 230, what every nursing home is a little bit different with the daily rate is. So from that point forward, you're out of pocket. So you're looking at anywhere from 5,500 to 9,500 dollars a month for this nursing home. A lot of times that's when I get called. People are panicked. They, they've gotten a letter from the nursing home saying, you've got 15 days before you've got to start paying out of pocket. Here's what it's going to cost. And the family members call me and say, oh my God, my mom's only got 50,000 in the bank. She's going to blow through that in, in four or five months. You know, what do we do? Is there, what can we do? And they're in a crisis scenario because they didn't plan ahead, okay? If we had planned ahead, and maybe hired Sarah to come in and do, do her magic, maybe we could have kept that at home with assistance and prevented the fall in the first place. Maybe he never had to go to the nursing home. Remember, and now it's a lot cheaper to pay somebody for two, three, or four hours per day to help you than it is to pay that nursing home for full-time care. So that's what this is about. If you look at the bottom of it, um, the only thing that you get government help with as far as financial help, 
is the far right end of the spectrum, which is the most expensive, right? So that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So the government will only help you pay for what's most expensive, which is the nursing. So unfortunately, what happens is people don't have any money to private pay for an assisted living facility or for home health care. What ends up happening is they just go without it until they're hurt so bad they have to go to the nursing. Uh, or maybe they could get by with the left, left with the lower level of care, but because they don't have funds, they have to go straight into the nursing home so that they, so that Medicaid will pay the bills. Okay, so let's uh, let's go back to the beginning. You, you need to you need this to show the screen, or you want to the screen? Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So. We've, we've gone through this some. Uh, you guys all have this handout you can read. I'm not a big one. I, I normally don't even do PowerPoint presentations. If we weren't doing that, uh, if people weren't watching on the on the computer, we wouldn't even be doing it. I'd much rather have conversations with people and, and go through it than I would a PowerPoint. But let's keep, keep going. So keep going. Yeah, this is not good. Look, look at your PowerPoints. There's a lot of, if you don't, uh, I'm going to email everybody that would like one. By all means, go through it. I'm just going to keep talking because I do that. The way nursing homes work in general, you go into a nursing home and you have to private pay. There's, there's essentially two, two ways you pay for nursing. Home. You pay out of your pocket or you have long term care insurance. Last I checked, I think less than 9% of the population have long term care insurance that would, that would pay any of their nursing. Okay? So for most of us, we're paying out of pocket. So what happens is you go to the nursing home, they tell you, hey, no problem. Here's how this is going to work. You're going to give us all of your money until you go broke. Once you go broke, we're going to get you on Medicaid. So don't worry about it. You're not going to go without care. Your loved one is not going to do without. They're going to be well taken care of. You're going to get the same care whether you're on Medicaid or whether you're private pay. The view doesn't change, OK? You're going to pay us $240 a night or a day, and it is what it is. And they're going to take care of your loved one, and then it becomes the scenario where you hope you die before you run out of money. But even if you do run out of money, don't worry, because we'll get you on Medicaid. So the law, the rules for Medicaid is if you go and apply, there's, it works differently for married people and single people. Let's just talk about if you're single first. If you're single, they draw a line in the sand, they look backwards five years. They say, I want to know about every gift you've made in the last five years. So if you've been doing annual gifting, like we used to do when we were doing estate planning for taxes, which we don't do anymore most of this, unless you've got over 20, if you're married, if you've got over 22 million dollars, we need to talk. If, if not, don't worry about it, okay? If you're single, it's, it's 11.8 something. So unless you've got 11.8 million dollars, don't worry about taxes, okay? There's no reason to be doing annual Get to, to, to try to avoid the state taxes. So, so let's say that you've given stuff away. You have to account for all that. And if it happened within the last five years, Medicaid will penalize those gifts. So let's say you haven't made any gifts. Okay, you've got what you've got. There's no gifts in the last five years. Let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollars of countable assets. Medicaid divides your assets up into. Well, first they say you've got income. And you've got assets, okay? They can't be both. It's either an income or an asset. Then they say you've got excludable assets and then countable assets. Countable asset is cash, stocks, bonds, uh, real estate that is not your house, um, you know, any kind of investment, all that kind of good stuff. Non-countable assets would be, and I think I do have a slide here that you want to do. A non-countable asset would be your home while you're living. Okay, they exclude your home while you're still alive. 401ks, IRAs are non-countable assets in Kentucky. Don't let your loved one go to Ohio. They're countable in Ohio. Okay? Every state has its own Medicaid laws and different sites. So wherever you go, you need to make sure you, you have a Elder law attorney who knows that state's law. Um, prepaid burial contracts, burial trust, uh, prepaid funerals, 
$1,500 of cash value in a life insurance policy, which conversely means if you've got more than that, anything above $1,500 is countable. And I run in, into that a lot. Um, one vehicle of any value. Okay. So whether it's a, a $100,000 Mercedes or a $10,000 Ford, it's excluded because it's one vehicle. Okay. Um, so, and there's there's some other stuff, but just for, you guys get the idea. So Medicaid says, you have a question, yes. What did you say about Ohio you, in your talk? You were oh, just saying uh, something. Ohio counts 401ks as a countable asset. Kentucky does not. Um, Kentucky allows for partial gift carrying. Ohio does not. Ohio is one of the hardest states in the, in the country to qualify for Medicaid. Um, so, What's, and ironically, a lot of the Kentucky, we have a hard time finding beds in Kentucky. A lot of facilities try to send them to Ohio. Keep that in mind. Refuse transfer, say, no, no, you're not sending my mom to Ohio because you just, you, you're going to, you know, you've got to have a million dollar pool one k that you just lost because the facility sent mom to Ohio instead of uh, Kentucky. Tennessee, I don't think counts them either, so maybe Tennessee would be an option. Um, so okay, so let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollars of asset that Medicaid says are countable asset. In order to qualify for Medicaid without doing without coming to me first or, or another elder law attorney, the way you qualify is you have to spend one hundred thousand dollars all the way down to two thousand dollars, and those numbers are in your uh, in the PowerPoint handouts as well. So. The nursing homes are very helpful in this regard, okay? The nursing homes are gonna tell you, hey, we're gonna help you spend that $100,000. <laughs> yeah, real, real quick, that's right. So you just give us your money, when, you know, $100,000 will last you, say, let's just say one year, and then next year, if mom's still alive, we'll go make application, we'll get her on Medicaid, you don't have to worry about anything. That's that's what the nursing homes are telling you. And they're right, it does work that way if you want it to. Once you're on Medicaid, you don't get to keep your income. Your income goes to the nursing home every month, except for $40 a month. So you think about mom wanting to have her hair, you know, have a hairdo or, or whatever every month. That's not going to happen for $40 a month. She might have to save her money for six months, but she can have a, a beauty parlor visit or what have you in the nursing home. So you don't want to go broke in the nursing home. Where the other law attorneys come in is we we have spin down strategies and gifting strategies that allows you to save a portion of your money and still qualify. What I tell people as a general rule, if you're single, I can save at least half of your money. Okay? When I say save, I mean either purchase something that like a prepaid funeral or like a vehicle, okay? If, You've got a two thousand dollar clunker. Why not go buy a, a seventy thousand uh, dollar SUV? You just saved seventy thousand. It was otherwise going to go to nursing home, or and it, you know, and whatever's left, I can save at least half of once we've done our spin down strategies. So if you're married, this is where it's really nice to be married if you have to go to a nursing home. I can save all of your money if you're married. Okay, nursing homes don't tell you this either. They don't know it. That's why they don't tell you. Okay. Um, Medicaid planning is very similar to tax planning. If you want to, when you guys make money, you can give all your money in taxes and not have any deductions, you know, not take advantage of any write-offs, not get any tax credits. You don't have to get your money back from the government. They're happy to keep it. Okay. It's the same thing with, with the Medicaid plan. The Medicaid laws are written for a reason. They say we want people to be able to take advantage of these laws. And if they don't qualify, if they don't get all these calm loopholes, if you like, but it's just the law. If you don't take advantage of the law, then you can give all your money to the nursing home. The government's happy for you to do that. Okay? Because you know they're going to have budgetary problems anyway. So for every person that just gives all their money to the nursing home, that's one less person for every, however long that they could have been qualified. Otherwise, if they don't have to pay for it. So I have a lot of people say, you know, I don't feel really good about this because, you know, the government needs money and 
uh, you know, I think, boy, you're 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 a nice guy. I sure don't, you know, the government needs money. I understand that, but I sure don't want to give them more than a half. So that's the way I look. That's the way I look at the planning stuff. It's sort of an inside. So, in doing the planning, uh, let's let's start flipping through this a little bit. We, we talked about that. Okay, go back to go back. Estate recovery. So, I mentioned that the house is exempt while you're alive. Once you pass away, Medicaid has a lien on your estate for all the money that they have spent on you for your long term care. So, if they're spending $4,000 a month for 10 months, that's $40,000 lien that they'll have against your estate when you die. So, you don't want to own anything when you pass away. Because Medicaid can come back and, and, and get the money. Okay. Um, then this is another advantage to being married because you're allowed to transfer your house to your spouse. And the, the institutionalized spouse can be totally impoverished, while the community spouse, which is the healthy at home spouse, can still have uh, a lot of money and income and all that all that kind of good stuff. So they put they put rules in specifically not to impoverish. The at home spouse and the rationalization is we don't want to have to take care of both of them. If we can let one keep money and take care of herself, while we have to pay for for dad to be in the nursing home, so be it. Last thing we want is to blow all their money. Well, now we have to take care of both of them. One to you know one who's completely impoverished living at home and one who's in the nursing. Home. So, but if you own the property when you die, they will come out. Okay, and this has been the single scenario. Because if you're married, obviously you're going to transfer the resources to your spouse uh, before you get to that point. And they'll make you spend your own money before they put you on Medicaid in the first place. So all you would have left would be that, usually. Okay? Got to be careful you don't leave life insurance to your estate. So if you've got a life insurance policy that's in place, maybe it was a term or maybe it was a whole life and just didn't have much cash value. You don't want to make your estate the beneficiary because now Medicaid can come and take all that money. You need to be really careful about loved ones. I've got clients right now where the son is in a nursing home on Medicaid. He's got a terrible disease. They thought it was Parkinson's at first, but super neuro something. I, I can't, can't remember what it's called, but it, it's just totally debilitating. He's in a nursing home and he's on Medicaid. His father, who is still living at home up until a few months ago, okay, was, is in his 90s, son's in his 70s. Dad had, had done estate planning with just the local attorney who wasn't an elder law and was basically an outright, outright bequest to all, to all his four children. They each get, he had, he's got about $400,000 of uh, property, they each get $100,000 split equally. What happens to the one son who's already in a nursing home, already on Medicaid? What happens to his one hundred thousand dollars if Dad dies first? It goes right back to the state. It either knocks him off of his Medicaid, to where he'll have to spend it all at the nursing home before he qualifies for Medicaid again, or if he dies before he spends it all, it all goes right back to the estate recovery. Now, I'm pretty sure Dad did not. I know he didn't because I think, thankfully. I found out about it before Dad, Dad still lived in so. But I changed all that before. But he had just had this done. So this attorney that did his estate planning either didn't know to ask or just didn't ask. Hey, do you have any beneficiaries who are currently disabled, who are currently receiving SSI benefits, who are currently receiving Medicaid benefits? Because if you leave money to these people, you just screwed up their benefits. Uh, there's a lot of people who have special needs children who are receiving SSI. Um, one way to think of elder law uh, planning is we're special needs planning for, for the elder. You live long enough, you will become a special needs person because your activities of daily living will reduce to the point where you need it. Now, I'm getting close on my time. What time was I supposed to be in right now? Okay. Can I, I've got five minutes? Nice. Okay. <coughs> So since I've got five minutes, let's use this as an opportunity to, to take questions. So did, have I brought up any questions? Yes, ma'am. How do you get the house without, you know, um, the five-year thing? What's the best strategy? My mom has a house. 
She needs to sell it all the way. Is, 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 is mom, is dad passed away already? They're, um, no, but they're not married. They're they not get, married. They get remarried. She's saving them. I mean, if that's going to help. <laughs> the question was, what do we do with the I house? I might suggest that. Uh, that's, a great, I mean, that's a great question. So the question was, what do we do with the house? He's healthy. If, um, if we're in that scenario, we, we have it planned ahead, so we're in a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So it's too late to do the five year look back. By the way, two types of clients one's proactive, one is crisis. Proactive means we at least think we can get through a five year look back. We don't always succeed, but we're relatively hopeful. The crisis is we know we're not getting through a five year look back. Mom's either in a nursing home or she's in the hospital getting ready to go to the nursing home. Okay? So in that scenario, we could, we could do one of now. If you have a child who's permanently and totally disabled, you can transfer all of your assets to that child without any penalty. I'm not talking about mental disabilities per se. You know, my dad worked at Toyota and had some heart problems and had cancer. He's 100% permanently and totally disabled on Social Security. He'll stay on disability until he reaches his normal Social Security age. Then it'll switch to the Social Security. My grandparents couldn't transfer all of their assets to my dad without him. Without him, we do that a lot. Okay, even if they're siblings, even if they don't get along, it's amazing how quick they start getting along when they find out that they can save all these hundreds of thousands of dollars just by getting along for a little while. Okay, um, if you're married, you can transfer the house. You said, what if she gets married? I don't see why that wouldn't work. Okay, if she got remarried, she could then transfer the house to the the couple the well spouse or the community spouse is the terms of Medicaid use, and then the house is protected. Okay, but the bad thing is if dad has any assets, we're going to use that in the calculation for the spend that. But if we're married, we can transfer them right back uh, through various various ways. So what what if you can't transfer dad, maybe that mom's a widow or whatever. In that scenario, remember I said we can save half. I can at least save half of the equity of the home. And the way we do that is, is what they call the half a loaf strategy or the gift and gift back strategy. If we give $100,000 away, whether it's equity or whether it's cash, okay, we give it away to a trust. We get penalized for that. We get $100,000 worth of penalty. As we pay the money back to mom so that she can pay for her care, we cure that penalty. So we end up meeting in the middle. So if, if I give away a hundred thousand, I can save fifty of it, okay, through the gift back process. So imagine a uh, imagine a twelve month penalty. Every month I give back one month's worth of, of money. I knock a month off the end of the penalty. I cure one month. Month two, cure another month. Month three, cure another month. We end up meeting at month six. I pay through half the penalty and I've cured the other half. I go back and make another application of Medicaid. While I'm on, on qualifies. It's not perfect. I still had to spend half, but uh, like when my bosses used to tell me, 50% of something is way better than 100% nothing. Okay? So the if, if you don't come to me first, you're in the scenario where you're 100% nothing. I've used up all my time. Please call me with any questions. Feel free to schedule an appointment. I, I do give Lexington appointments. Just call me and we can schedule Lexington appointment as well. Yes. One question is, um, what's your hourly rate for your firm, for your rate? Oh, well, uh, my hourly rate is $200 an hour, but I give free consultations on the planning. I don't even charge hourly unless I'm doing guardianship work. Or anything that gets me in court, I have to charge hourly. Otherwise, it's a flat fee, and it's, based, it's just based on whatever services I'm doing. You pay me one fee, and you basically own me. If you, if you, purchase Sarah's services in addition to the legal stuff, so you get the full life care plan, you get her, you get access to her for a full year. So it's an annual subscription. So where she's going to do an initial concept, initial assessment and quarterly checkups, in addition to any placement that you might need. Maybe you don't like where mom is, you want to get her moved to a different facility. Uh, she spends a lot of time working with facilities and getting placed. I appreciate you guys coming here together to watch understand. Feel free to leave. And if you're watching me on the computer, you're probably at work and you're happy to.
keep uh, <laughs> keep learning on, on UK's dime, I guess. So. Any okay. other any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What should someone bring with them for a first time? Good, good. The question was, what do you need to bring with you for a first, for an initial consultation? The answer to that is more the better. So if, if you've got current POA, current estate planning documents, uh, if you've got current, uh, if you know the balance sheet for mom, that's perfect. So I need to know what the assets and liabilities are. I need to know what mom's intentions are with her estate planning. Uh, you know, if she wants to disinherit one of the children, I need to I need to see documentation there before you know. If, if you just come to me and say, you know what, my my brother, he's no good. We're going to disinherit him. I, I can't do that <laughs> unless mom wanted that to be done before she lost her past. So if and if you guys want to fill these out inside of your there's a concerns assessment. If you want to fill that out and leave that with me, if you have any other comments, you want me to call you. I'm happy to do so. I'll probably make I'll probably have Sarah do it. You'd rather speak with her anyway. Um, otherwise, any, if there's no more questions, I appreciate it. Was, was that helpful, I hope? Okay, thank you. So we want to say thank you very much for coming in. This is just a little bit of work life swag. Nice. A little swag, I'll give that to you. Nothing, give that nothing to too fancy or anything. Okay. Um, want to tell everybody that we are going to have a PowerPoint presentation on our website along with this. So, I mean, all of everything that was required to go out and do. There's a lot of good information in the PowerPoint. I just didn't go through it because you guys can read. You don't need me to read this off. That's boring. I used to go to school and I just go to sleep and somebody started doing the podcast. So, so. I'm, I'm trying not to put my audience to sleep. So, anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much.